How's it going, guys? Welcome to episode 104 of Talk 4, the quick fire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And let me introduce our, wow, very special guest for today, Samuel Raz Larson, is going to be answering some questions today. Raz, how's your day going so far, man? And uh, welcome to the show, dude. Appreciate you having me. Uh, it's awesome to be here. Uh, it's been a great day, great off season for us, and uh, we're excited getting ready for the uh, 2024 air show season. It's going to be good, and uh, really, really hoping to get to see some uh, display flying over there in the States at some point uh, in this year, or at least next year for sure. But um, yeah, so for those who don't know you, um, can we get like maybe the 30 to 60 second-ish kind of elevator pitch rundown of just who you are, what your day job is, and uh, you know, pull no punches, how cool what you get to do is and stuff. So yeah, take it away, man. Absolutely. Uh, Captain Samuel Larson, call sign Raz. 2023-2024 F-22 demonstration team commander. So I get the privilege of leading uh, 14 individuals, doing about 30 shows a year, uh, showing off uh, my favorite aircraft, the F-22, uh, and the aircraft I've flown for my entire uh, Air Force career. So cool. I mean, what a uh, what an aircraft to fly in a career, right? And I mean, it's just so insane because I've um I've been a, I've been a huge a huge aviation fan for quite a long time now. And uh, without overging this podcast, and by over G, I mean over geek, F F twenty two is by far my favorite aircraft as well. So we've got the uh, the demo pilot here, which is just beyond cool. And um yeah, man, let's um let's rip this back a bit then to start with. So obviously we see where you're at now with all the um you know display flying the videos the photos which are all just so mm -hmm. so cool and that's obviously like a product you've got now but i'd love to uh you know dive into the deep end with a bit of a backstory so um have a look at your air force bio you've got such a profound career even before being on the demo team so wind me back how did this all start for you and uh, what was that initial push or kind of passion at least to join the air force absolutely uh so my start was was air shows which is why it's awesome i get to do the job i'm doing now because it's an opportunity to uh, pay forward, really the profound impact that uh, that air shows had on me when I was a youngster. I grew up in Davenport, Iowa, had a hometown air show. That's what I grew up going to, was immediately hooked, knew I wanted to be a pilot. And throughout the years, got to meet uh, demo pilots, maintainers from different teams, Blue Angels, Thunderbirds, ACC teams. And that kind of illuminated the way forward for me uh, as far as options that were out there and this opportunity to serve uh, in the capacity of being uh, maybe a fighter pilot. So I set my goals on that. Uh, I was an aviation nut uh, growing up. And uh, in high school, I was working for a uh, aviation magazine, taking pictures and writing articles and uh, wound up at the Air Force Academy for college, uh, again, with the goal of being a, uh, being a fighter pilot. I uh, did my four years there and uh, had my sights set again on, on flying fighters someday. Uh, while I was there, I was on the parachute team, so I got some exposure to uh, uh, basic airmanship stuff uh, as far as jumping out of airplanes and was doing some, some private flying on the side uh, and then went off to pilot training after that. Shortly before I started uh, pilot training, saw an F-22 demo at an air show. Really stuck with me, really had a big impact uh, watching it fly that day. and. Uh, that kind of is what tipped me of, yeah, I'd like to fly F-22s. That became my goal when I started pilot training and was very fortunate. Uh, after pilot training, got selected to fly the uh, the F-22 and been flying it ever since. So uh, I'd say it really boils down to air shows and the folks, whether they're military or civilian, who took the time out of their day to chat with me, uh, give me some mentorship and advice, really had a big impact on my life. And uh, I owe it all to... Uh, to the existence of air shows because there's no way I would have found my way uh, to this without them. Uh, no really aviation or military background in my family. Uh, so again, all air shows. There's a, um, there's a story that's really gone full circle just forward right there so cool that you've got to uh kind of live at least what that childhood dream was and you know people who speak to on the show people who get to do that so happy with their job and uh you know before we move on to the next question just like scale of one to ten how happy are you with your, your day job 100 <laughs> percent a uh, 10 best job i ever had uh probably the best job i ever will have so it's uh it's too short in my opinion. I uh, always w wish I could do it longer because uh, it is it's a quick two year uh, gig getting to do this. But I'm incredibly incredibly fortunate uh, to have this opportunity, 
and to work with the team that I get to work with because uh, the folks who comprise the F-22 demo team, uh, it goes, uh, there's a lot of folks beyond me uh, who put in a ton of work and make this team what it is and getting to work with them day in and day out makes this uh best job in the world, in my opinion. So, yeah, absolutely. It, it comes down to the team and that's what they said at the blue angels too. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes there with that team there as well. And especially all these teams, especially where you're dealing with something that's so complicated and has so many moving parts. And I don't mean just the aircraft. I mean, from coordination to PR to, you know, inspiring the youth and everything, getting people into aviation. You know, there's so many different bits and bobs that are moving in all of that. So having a strong team is obviously critical. Um, but, you know, I, I read and um, did a bit of research and stuff that the US only really has about, you know, it's just shy of about 200 F-22s. I think it was in the 180s somewhere. And uh, so undoubtedly, it's a very, very rare thing to be a pilot for it. And, you know, I was just wondering, can you give me a bit of like insight into how you got involved with the Raptor then? And also like how lucky do you have to be or just how skilled do you have to be to kind of earn a place in that cockpit? Because it just seems like like from what you said, you went straight to it almost. How, how does that look? How does that career do that? Because <laughs> it seems pretty crazy. <laughs> Yep. Uh, starting out when the F-22 first became uh, operational, there wasn't really much of an opportunity to go straight from pilot training uh, to the F-22. That's become uh, much more prevalent and that pipeline's open now. Uh, so for any prospective uh, young aviators who are going through Air Force pilot training, you can absolutely uh, go straight into an, an F-22 these days. Um, pilot training, it's basically you start with a clean slate so you compete uh, through whatever commissioning source you go through uh, for a pilot slot. And I always tell people uh, grades are really important, attitude, work ethic, things things outside of school that you enjoy, just being well-rounded will get you that pilot slot. But then you show up to pilot training and uh, nothing that you did up to that point matters. It's all about how you perform uh, during pilot training. So it's a 55-week program. I mentioned I saw the F-22 conveniently right before I started that program, which really uh, gave me a lot of motivation uh, each and every day to just think about uh, on that assignment night when you find out what you're going to fly, seeing an F-22 up on the screen behind me. That definitely motivated a lot of my decision making uh, on a day to day basis. Uh, but you're graded on everything in pilot training, academic tests, simulators, flights, check rides, all the normal stuff. You're also graded subjectively on how you work with your classmates as a teammate. Um, technically you're competing against those folks, uh, for how you're going to be ranked at the end of the, uh, end of the course, but it really is important to keep in mind that you're competing against yourself to be the best version of yourself every day and not necessarily competing against those classmates. So I went through that 55 week program, did the best I could uh, as a challenging year. Uh, they put a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff on your plate throughout that entire course. Uh, but at the end of the course, you get rack and stacked in your class, one through however many uh, students are in that course. And then you submit a dream sheet uh, where you rank every platform. And this is where the luck and timing piece kind of comes into play uh, to answer that question of, is the aircraft you want to fly available in, in your drop? And uh, did you basically rank well enough to uh, get married up with that aircraft? I think a cool thing uh, that some folks don't know about is if you do a great job and you really put in the work ethic, uh, you really have a good attitude, you're humble, the instructors and the folks who are in, in charge of that drop are going to try to get you uh, the airplane that you want to fly. And so if it's not available in that drop, they will try to negotiate uh, with the powers that be to get that airplane available in that drop. So that's a piece of it as well, but there's definitely luck and timing of as you said, there's limited F-22 cockpits, limited F-22 uh, basic course slots available. So there is a little bit of timing. And uh, I always like to tell people, uh, if you work really hard uh, and keep a good attitude, then that that luck and timing thing tends to work itself out. You're able to create a little bit of your own luck there. So I was very fortunate in that regard. Um, and it was a big transition going from flying a T-38 straight into flying a, uh, an F-22. That's a bit of a leap in, uh, in capabilities of aircraft, uh, but it's very doable. And the, the course is designed uh, to take folks who have only flown a T-38 uh, to train them, up, train them up into how to fly an F-22. I'm trying to draw some dots here then. So 
uh, from, from what I know and what I definitely know is that there's no two seat F-22s out there and stuff. So I imagine a lot of the um, the training and stuff obviously is done in simulators and everything. So, uh, you know, before we move on, while we're talking about inspiring people to um, take up that role and go into this and everything, what was a, uh, a first flight out in the F-22 cockpit like for you uh, after a lot of simulation and stuff, I imagine? Um, I mean, obviously, like, like we say, um, renowned to be the most you know advanced fighter jet really uh out there in terms of air to air combat and stuff and i'm not sure how long ago how many years ago was it when you um when you took that first flight but yeah describe that how was that that very first one you bet uh first flight mine was in 2017 at tyndall air force base and uh yeah i'll never forget it it as you said it's a lot of simulators so you basically go through an entire basically simulator syllabus prior to ever even touching the aircraft. And through those simulators, you've learned the basics. You've also learned every emergency. They kind of throw the whole book at you and you're able to handle uh, every emergency uh, that could possibly happen in the jet, which there are a lot. So it's a long, uh, long time in the sim before you ever get in the aircraft. Uh, for your first flight, you fly as a two ship. So instructors in another F-22. Uh, but to your point, there's no uh, dual seat aircraft, so you are solo in your jet, uh, and it's an adrenaline rush and uh, very, uh, very nerve wracking because uh, you've never been in charge of such an expensive piece of equipment before. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me, or a couple of things that stood out to me, even on the ground, we we warm up the flight controls, so you're moving all the flight control surfaces, and they're so massive that even sitting on the ground, you're basically getting bu bucked around in the cockpit and feeling just how powerful those uh, flight control surfaces are. So that was very eye-opening, uh, kind of a holy smokes moment. And then uh, what gets a lot of people is just how powerful the engines are. So we'll take off in mill power. It's our highest power setting uh, below uh, being an afterburner. And the jet just accelerates uh, at a crazy rate. And so you're climbing out, following an the other F-22 uh, that your instructor's in, and you're trying to hold an airspeed, I think it was around 440 knots, and you keep raising the nose up, trying to hold that airspeed, and the jet keeps accelerating, and you keep raising the nose up, and uh, guys have gotten close to accidentally going supersonic uh, because the jet has that super cruise capability, uh, and unintentionally booming the Florida coast is a real thing. So uh, that was definitely eye-opening, uh, but, what was really awesome about that first flight is just how intuitive the jet is to fly and just how simple it is to do basic things in the aircraft. And it was really designed that way. It's designed to be simple to fly so that the pilot could focus on the tactical aspects of the flying. So taking off landing, flying from A to B, uh, it is just a joy and a pleasure to fly the, uh, the F-22. Once you start fighting it against other aircraft, uh, again, with all that capability, that's where it gets really challenging for students because there's a huge learning curve uh, to keep up with the jet and learn how to uh, really maximize the systems that are on board that aircraft. Yeah, I can imagine for sure. Um, okay, so we're there, first flights and everything. Let's um, mm -hmm. let's let's round off backstory and get to kind of present day and everything. Then, so looking at the kind of the Air Force website bio and stuff, um, I read that you were. Uh, one of your job titles or positions was the F-22 Mission Commander. So can you um, maybe quickly describe what the job was there that you were doing and um, and then kind of lead us through to present day, like how does this role of the demo pilot come about for you? Absolutely. So Mission Commander is uh, an upgrade uh, along the upgrade flow of all the other stuff you do as a, as a fighter pilot in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, so kind of the standard flow after you get through the basic course uh, you're a wingman for a while, where your job is to just learn and learn, uh, soak up as much as you can, uh, study all the time, and get as tactically proficient as you can, while other folks are leading you around in uh, in combat training scenarios or in actual combat. Uh, your next upgrade is a two-ship flight lead upgrade, so uh, you'll go through that. Now you can lead two F-22s in training or in combat. That's followed by a four-ship flight lead upgrade. The mission commander is kind of a special one that usually tends to happen right before or after you go through the instructor pilot upgrade. But that's uh, that's accomplished at big exercises like a red flag Nellis or checkered flag down in Florida, where you're basically in, in charge of an entire package of, uh, of airplanes. Uh, so you'll be the mission commander and you're going to have all kinds of platforms um, on the Blue Air Forces for that day. So. Raptors, F-15s, F-16s, A-10s, all the good stuff. You could have strike aircraft involved uh, going up against a, a simulated Red Force. 
and you're in charge of the uh, the briefing of that entire package and the debriefing and then the leadership for airborne execution. Uh, so that was the uh, the reason that's in my bio. I completed that while I was up in Alaska uh, when I was starting my instructor pilot upgrade up there in Alaska as well, and then uh, followed that up with the uh, with the instructor pilot upgrade uh, in the F twenty two. And uh, in order to be a demo pilot, you have to be an uh, instructor pilot in the uh, in the Raptor to apply. Nice, very nice stuff, man. Um, okay, so uh, moving moving forward, uh, something I wanted to touch on was that. Uh, so some of the past guests I've had, I've been really, really privileged to have had some truly like great people on the show from all walks of life. But I've, I've been, um, I've been through my my rounds of the aviation guys too. I'm sure there's a load of names I could uh pull out which you'd be familiar with and everything but you know to, to pull out a couple of them um one of the guys from my country who was the Eurofighter demo pilot a few years ago Jim Peterson here in the UK um and Rain and maybe you guys your paths may have crossed um in the air show timeline somewhere around there he was the F-16 Viper demo pilot with you guys um well both of those dudes sang the same tune when I asked them uh what the best fighter jet in the world is in their opinion and um obviously those guys uh their favorite jets must have been the ones that they were flying obviously and stuff but they couldn't deny that the best fighter jet in the world in their opinion was the f-22 raptor so it got me asking the question why exactly is that like this is not a brand new jet is it so what do you think uh makes it so special and why has this jet been so unmatched at the top of the food chain for all these years despite being actually kind of old almost well, I'm obviously biased uh, in this discussion, and it's certainly a subject uh, open to a lot of great debate uh, because there's a lot of platforms all around the world that bring unique and special capabilities to the fight. I think what makes the F-22 special is all the capabilities that were tied into the aircraft uh, that represented a generational leap forward in air combat. And in my mind, it's the... Uh, it's, the fighter pilot's dream of an aircraft uh, because it is a 9G gunfighter, a uh, great dogfighter, but it also ushered in all these uh, other unique capabilities uh, that our fourth gen fighters didn't really have at the time. And so some of those uh, for maneuvering, super maneuverability, very advanced flight control system, those massive flight controls I was talking about, uh, do some incredible things while we're flying. And uh, those are paired with uh, the most powerful uh, engines that we ever put on a fighter and the F-119. So 70,000 pounds of thrust in, in max AB. So that allows the, the jet to do things that no other combat ready fighter can do uh, when you're talking loaded, full of fuel, full of uh, munitions, the jet's 9G capable and can do all those cool maneuvers that we do in air shows. Uh, so that's that's definitely part of it, and uh, just from a flying standpoint, makes it a joy to fly. The original tech order that came out, uh, kind of the uh, the pub for the pilots, if you will, said you may fly this aircraft with reckless abandon. Uh, they actually wrote that in there. They they took that out after a couple of years because fighter pilots, of course, figured out a way to uh, uh, to make them want to take that out of the uh, out of the pub. Um, <laughs> but it is designed to be incredibly uh, resistant to departing controlled flight. And going back to our previous discussion, when you're flying around maneuvering, say in a dogfight 1v1, you're not really worried uh, about pushing the aircraft outside the envelope because it has such an expansive flight envelope. And you're not worried about departing controlled flight because it's designed where you can focus solely on your fight and not worry about, uh, worry about issues with the aircraft. Some other capabilities that were rolled into that, if you ever get up close to an F-22, it is a large machine, a uh, big aircraft, but it's uh, incredibly stealthy. And unlike uh, predecessors like the stealth fighter, the F-117, uh, it still was able to take the, forward that uh, stealth technology and build upon it. But again, now you have a super maneuverable platform that can uh, super cruise, so go beyond Mach 1 without the use of afterburners and go uh, Mach 2 up to 60,000 feet. Uh, along with all those capes, uh, it also has uh, a very, very impressive uh, sensor array and sensor fusion. So everything on the jet from the radar to the other sensors are working together all the time, fusing that picture together and then presenting a nice, pretty, easy to read uh, display to the pilot 
uh, so you can make quick decisions, have a good essay of friends and foes where everyone's at and uh, be more effective in a combat situation. So rolled in all these capabilities into one platform. And again, that was a generational leap being the first fifth gen fighter. Uh, and again, I'll say, I think it's, uh, it's a, every fighter pilot's dream uh, to have an aircraft that has that amount of capability, uh, specifically in the air-to-air -air realm. Uh, so that's why I think it's uh, I think it's an awesome machine. And because those capabilities were ahead of their time, uh, it's really stood the test of time being now over 20 years old that the, uh, the F-22 is still, uh, still doing well out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, it's something that my mum has always said to me since, since a little kid about, you know, everything from like a, a toy as a kid to products and everything is that if, if you have a great product, there's always something new to be discovered in it. So out of curiosity, does, does that jet keep surprising you every now and then with stuff it can do? Or are you like so sort of, um, you know, are you so integrated with that thing and its capabilities and its absolute maxes and all all situations that you just know exactly what that thing can do or does it occasionally be like oh i didn't know it could do that still you get a pretty good uh idea early on uh as far as how to max perform the aircraft uh, we spend time uh call them advanced handling uh flights where we we go out and try to push the aircraft to the edge and then take that into our bfm basic fighter maneuvers and get a lot a lot of practice uh getting to see what the aircraft can do uh, when you're fighting another Raptor, but there are still times uh, where I'd say I get a little surprised as far as um, just how well the jet can perform some maneuvers at different altitudes, things of that sort, and uh, how much thrust you can get out of those engines and what that allows you to do. And when it's really, really uh, eye-opening is when you're fighting uh, in a 1v1 dogfight against another fighter that's not a Raptor. That's where you really get an appreciation for uh, the maneuvering capabilities of the jet, because again, a lot of other combat uh, ready fighters uh, cannot perform those maneuvers. So you get a lot of appreciation when you're doing the dissimilar uh, BFM. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, actually, so on, on the flip side of that, if we look at the adverse side of, of this, so you take something like the F-22, which is so close to perfection, but I think I heard it like a, um, may have discussed this before on the show at some point as well. I think it was someone, I can't remember who it was, but I think I heard there was a like a training exercise, maybe a simulation or or something with a German Eurofighter where an F-22 got quite slow. I think it may have lost a dogfight at some point, but, you know, ask the, um, ask, ask the pilot that you are, who's got so much experience in this jet, uh, where are like the, uh, the areas for improvement in something that's so close to like, being seemingly so perfect like what would you say okay still i would like this to be there maybe this could improve or we need to add this into it or maybe technology has just evolved and you know i know some people are talking about hypersonics and and um and stuff like this and maybe some laser technology and bits and bobs like that but yeah where would you say uh kind of like the gaps to fill at least with the next generation or what what's going to be the um you know the evolution of the f-22 at least absolutely uh, I'll talk about as much as I can in terms of upgrades to the aircraft. Uh, to your point, in those dissimilar dogfights, uh, F-22s have, have lost in, in training uh, scenarios. We get that question all the time at air shows. I thought this jet was unbeatable. Turns out, no, uh, you can make a mistake, and uh, we'll, we'll send young guys up fight uh, dissimilar platforms, and they'll make a mistake, and uh, it, it'll cost them, and they learn from it. That's why we do it in training. So. Uh, you can still make mistakes and uh, and stuff can happen. And, uh, you know, another fighter will get a win against an F-22. It's just part of the game. And that's why uh, that's why we we train and experience really matters. And getting a, a lot of repetitions uh, and training hacks uh, really helps you max perform that aircraft because you should win those fights based on the capability of the aircraft. So uh, in terms of what the F-22 uh, can improve upon, I think the, the platform itself and the maneuvering capabilities, uh, that's not going to change. The, the jet is doing uh, everything we would need it to do uh, in terms of maneuvering capabilities. But we're always talking upgrades to uh, sensors, upgrades to weaponry, uh, upgrades for both our offensive and defensive capabilities. So I, I can't get into all the stuff that's coming down the line, but there will be upgrades to the jet. And we're really just trying to uh, keep pace with our pacing threats around the world and uh, keep the Raptor at the top of the food chain, uh, like you said. Uh, so that's what those upgrades are uh, intended to do. Uh, 
And again, the Raptor is an old airplane. It's not brand new anymore. It's been around for a while. Uh, the jet was on the drawing book uh, in the 80s, first flight in the late 90s. So if you think about where technology was in the late 90s with computers and things of that sort, uh, it paints a, a bit of a picture of how far we've come just in that span uh, to present day. And so keeping the, F, uh, the F-22 up to date with all of that technology uh, and uh, I think the upgrades are going to be aimed primarily towards uh, the sensor capabilities of the jet and then offensive and defensive capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, a comparison we can draw is like the evolution of a smartphone. I remember when you had to, um, you know, I'm, I'm young, but I still remember those days where you had to click A or one four times to get like a capital C or for a text message or something. And then you look at what we've got nowadays in our in our phones and technology and stuff. And uh, you can only you can only imagine what, what's going on in the uh, defense sector nowadays with that. But so on on the show, typically, uh, obviously, like I said, big aviation fan, so I'm going to try and stray away from just getting aviation fodder and get some actionable intel for people listening in as well, because that's what I try and do. I want people to walk away with uh, something to um, something to have learned at least about or be able to apply like into their personal life too. So um, as a demo pilot who's showcasing such precision and skill of a jet of that caliber, what are like some of the prep? in the moment or like post-flight routines practices or methods that you're kind of doing and using um which other people can also apply into you know their their projects their competitions and moments that also require just high performance and and very switched on heads to uh to make the right decisions and have quick reactions so you know pre-flight in flight post-flight any great practices or things that we could kind of strip away from it and uh, apply into our personal lives uh, you bet. Yeah. So I'll talk both demo and just day-to-day F-22 flying. For day-to-day F-22 flying, uh, your prep uh, is very important. Individual prep, studying, and mission planning, uh, we take very seriously and, and devote a lot of our time to that. Uh, when we're not flying, a lot of our time is devoted uh, to mission planning for the next sortie. And then our brief, our briefs are very regimented uh, prior to flying. So if you're in a four ship of F-22s, that brief really sets the tone for the day and uh, and how concise and uh, kind of how you conduct yourself in that brief and gets everyone on the same page. So we really put a, uh, a lot of emphasis on that brief and it does set the tone and set you up for success. Uh, on the demo side of things, I'm flying by myself, so I'm not really briefing with anyone who's going to be flying with me. We still conduct briefs with our safety observer and other folks on the team, so we're all on the same page. Uh, but visualization has been very important for me. Uh, and you'll see it a lot of air shows, whether it's a civilian or military performer, uh, some guy walking around, some guy or gal uh, walking around, looks like they're uh, they're doing a little uh, dance by the aircraft. Uh, but that's walking through the routine. And I found that very important. And any time that I don't do that, uh, I do not fly as well uh, if I have not gone through that visualization. And what it is, since we are flying a rehearsed routine in the demo, it's regimented. I have numbers that I'm uh, going to hit um, and parameters for every maneuver. I basically am visualizing uh, from the uh, site survey stuff I've done previously flying over the field or imagery that I have of everything I'm going to see and every uh, everything I'm going to do during that demonstration. And I'm accounting for that day's weather, uh, winds on the surface, winds aloft. And uh, again, I find it very, very important. And that's usually about 30 minutes prior to me flying where I'm walking through the entire routine. And if it's gonna be a really challenging day uh, based on weather or circumstances, I'm gonna walk it three or four times the whole routine uh, and visualize everything I'm gonna see. So I think there's uh, applications to that uh, in other jobs, uh, other endeavors of that visualization. Uh, so that when it comes time uh, to perform, and whatever you are doing, you're not reacting uh, to everything because you've already prepped for it um, and you are now uh, much more proactive and on top of uh, everything that you need to be assessing. So uh, that's been really important to me. And then I would say uh, for execution, again, it really, whether it's in a combat training sortie or a demo, it goes back to your mission planning and your prep. Uh, it's gonna set the tone for how you execute. And uh, if you're trying to figure it out on the fly when you're executing, it's usually too late. So. Uh, it's really important to get that prep in. And then the uh, the standard, standard to which we debrief, and again, this is for both our day-to-day -day flying and uh, for demo, we, uh, we try to be really hard on ourselves. And uh, there's a lot of honest 
and painful feedback in debriefs, but that's really important for the unit. It builds a lot of cohesion and trust because you know people are uh, when folks are debriefing you, uh, they're being truthful and they're they're critiquing you and uh, every mistake you made because uh, we're all trying to get better. And again, that builds a uh, trust and cohesion throughout uh, all the folks. And then just holding yourself to a high standard uh, it allows us to get better each and every time we fly. So again, talked a lot about uh, the brief and debrief, but we really, uh, really put a lot of emphasis on those things. Uh, and we're trying not to solely rely on technology to be our advantage. We want the, uh, the standard to which we brief and debrief uh, to give us an edge uh, when we go out to, uh, to do this for real. Would love to quickly tap into a bit of pre-brief um, info, actually. So uh, something I took away from the Blue Angels podcast with uh, XO John Fay was a lot about the debrief. And we kind of spoke about how you would structure a, a really good debrief, even from like a personal standpoint or in a business. And I've certainly applied and in my daily to do lists and in my uh, my week plans and stuff, I've got my debrief down to a point. So um, I have a lot of good pointers in there. Uh, but I'd love to um, kind of do a part two to that almost and go into like what makes a great pre-brief. So without revealing sources and methods from the team or whatever, but what would you say like a great uh, pre-brief, even like from a personal standpoint or a business standpoint, what should that contain? Like if you strip it back to like skeletal structure of it, what should you start with? What should you end with? And what does it need to have? Like what, what do you need to interlace to make a pre-brief like really good, at least going into a week or into an air show, uh, which I imagine in some ways are quite similar in some of the principles. So yeah, just um, just how would you structure that? That's a great question. Uh, for demo briefs for us, uh, structure is pretty much the same everywhere we go. We call it motherhood is what we start out out with. And that's just all the basics, covering weather, notums, talking about where everyone is going to be, when they're going to be there. Uh, and it's just very, very basic information, talking about uh, we go through our timing, uh, what our ground show is going to look like, and then any variables that uh, are thrown into the plan at that specific event um, without talking anything about flying. So we we'll go through all of that. We talk through contingencies and emergency procedures, and we'll usually spend a, a good amount of time on that. Uh, just so that it's a nice rehack uh, prior to go flying to be ready uh, really for anything uh, and talk about all the logistics. Uh, for the flying portion, uh, it's helpful for me, uh, even before I go walk the routine, I basically walk through the entire uh, tire demonstration and heritage flight for flying in that day with the, with the team, announcers, our music guy, our safety observer, uh, and we go through uh, everything chronologically that we're going to do and then talk about what could throw us a, a curveball that day uh, in certain maneuvers uh, or in the show in general. So we go through uh, methodically through the brief and then wrap up with even more contingencies at the end. Uh, and that's our typical brief uh, for our day-to-day -day flying, like in a line unit, briefs are much more uh, in-depth because there's more variables uh, that we're trying to, uh, trying to mitigate how we're gonna react to those. So. I would say those are a lot more uh, in depth, probably tending to be about a little over an hour in those briefs, whereas a demo brief is probably about 30 minutes. But that's kind of the basic structure of how we do our briefing. Brilliant. Thanks very much. I think that's, uh, yeah, really applicable and something I want to at least interlace 100% personally into my into my life and my structure of a week and a month and a year. A uh, great pre-brief, I think, so important to set those goals rather than just having like a debrief, which is kind of a past thing. You need to look into the uh, into the future as well. But OK, so let's wrap this up um, after this last little question slash request I have here then. So um, a little bit of food for thought to the listeners leaving this podcast then. So what I find quite funny is that there's a lot of great photographers out there, right? And we take, you know, they take great photos of you doing the maneuvers and you often see the um, the vapor on the, the wings of the F-22 and it looks like so graceful. It looks so, especially in slow-mo, it looks so like majestic, right? But for those who know, you know that there's a, a little Raz sitting in that cockpit seat <laughs> right there that's fighting for his life. Uh, so I was wondering if you could like describe what the demo is like for you so kind of you know you get your foot out into the tarmac um all the way to kind of the uh you you know you're getting in the jet you're firing up and then you're doing the yeah, actually you, you how many g's you're pulling uh what your favorite maneuver is when that comes about uh just kind of go from like 
foot on tarmac to okay sweaty raz leaving f22 uh what is what is the whole thing like for you just kind of uh put us in your shoes for a minute absolutely uh really i'd say uh the the pre-brief all the stuff we talked about rehearsal stops as soon as we come to attention and start our ground show and then you start to lock in at that moment uh and then Usually got some nerves and uh, got the adrenaline going, and that tends to go away as soon as I close the canopy, and then it's just uh, feeling at home and 100% uh, focus on task at hand. Uh, so those nerves start to go away, um, and then it's, it's time to execute. Uh, the demo itself, uh, it is a blast to fly. I will not lie to you. Uh, getting to, to do what we do is low to the ground uh, that we get to fly it, um, and it is intense. Uh, the maneuvers themselves, they're, they really are basic derivations of maneuvers we do on a day-to-day -day basis in uh, like a BFM scenario. Uh, and they're designed to show uh, all the different things the F-22 can do in its expansive uh, flight envelope. So the maneuvers are not difficult to fly, but stringing them together and flying them uh, in that short sequence, uh, it can be challenging. And uh, to your question about G-forces, we get a pretty good amount of Gs uh, during the demo. Uh, so the most I've ever pulled uh, in the demo is 9.9 .9, uh, Gs uh, during one of the maneuvers. Uh, there are several times we'll go above nine uh, throughout the demo. Uh, it's something for G-forces in particular, something you get used to. Uh, and after doing it for so long, uh, it becomes second nature of how to handle those Gs. So anti-G straining maneuver is extremely important. And it's important to get wired in your brain that every time you're pulling back on the stick, you're automatically already starting to strain. Um, and anticipating those G-forces uh, and doing a good job, tensing up all the muscles below the heart to force that blood back to the brain. So that's become second nature. And that's something that is a big learning curve when you start flying the F-22. Uh, it can put the hurt on you. Uh, and if you're not careful, uh, when you're down low and going fast, uh, you can pull nine Gs and the jet's going to keep accelerating. Uh, we call it the crazy train. Um, and so you have to be able to anticipate that. and. Uh, and, and learn how to not get in that situation uh, when you're starting out. But during the demo, yeah, it's, it's a lot of G-forces. For some of the high alpha maneuvering, uh, again, it's something you get comfortable with doing it that low to the ground. Uh, we take the jet post stall quite a bit throughout the demo. So uh, the airframe is stalled, but we still have complete uh, nose authority and nose control thanks to thrust vectoring and that advanced flight control system. Uh, so just a lot of practice reps get you comfortable uh, with doing that. Um, so again, demo is a joy to fly. Uh, it's definitely a workout and, uh, it's definitely aggressive. Uh, I love getting to do it as far as favorite maneuver. I would say my, my favorite maneuver in our routine is the dedication pass, uh, for what it stands for. Uh, cause we dedicate it to all, uh, our fallen service members and their families. So, uh, I always get, uh, really enjoy flying that maneuver, uh, based on the meaning behind it. And then some of the more fun maneuvers to fly. Uh, from the cockpit perspective, like our power loop, it's basically a backflip where we're showcasing uh, the thrust vectoring of the jet. And so we're rotating about uh, in, in really one spot in the sky, and uh, it's kind of a wild ride in the cockpit. Uh, get a little light in the seat as the jet is basically uh, still is upside down, uh, but the nose is tracking faster than the rest of the fuselage, if that makes sense. And that's why it kind of looks like a a wild maneuver. Uh, so you're getting pretty tremendous nose rate through the vertical and then back on the other side of that loop. Uh, and the jet is actually doubling its altitude uh, throughout that entire maneuver. So that's, that one's a, a wild one to fly and uh, was definitely eye opening the first couple of times I flew it. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, clearly is from what you can see. Uh, okay, this is an absolute like, this is an absolute brainstorm question that is truly just one that is so typical me to ask because it's so random. But uh, so for me, um, I have a little bit of a flight time. So I got to fly uh, um, in an L-39 Albatross with a, a Top Gun graduate. And of course, I was whiz. Uh, we pulled about six and a half G, uh, broke that in an extra 330 LX, seven and a half G. And I'm just genuinely curious because after those experiences, my face literally for at least like two or three days still felt like it was separate from my skull, man. It, it felt horrible. <laughs> and at least like the night after those flights and stuff, going to sleep that night and stuff, 
I still felt like I was flying forwards up at my ceiling in my bedroom when I was looking up and stuff. So I just got to ask, man, when you do these air shows and you pull up to 9.9 Gs and you fly that jet with those engines at that velocity, what? how do you come down from that? Like when you get in bed at night, do you... Does, is it is it okay is it calm or are you kind of like oh shit i'm gonna hit the ceiling in a minute <laughs> <What's> <laughs> like i usually have a adrenaline high going for about two hours uh from when i flew and then uh and then that adrenaline goes to way uh, goes away and uh, uh usually tend to sleep pretty dang good after pulling a lot of g's uh so no problem sleeping uh i think that that definitely helps i'm usually pretty uh pretty tired out by the end of the day um but yeah kind of ride that adrenaline high uh right after i get done flying uh and again goes back to when i started out uh definitely really felt uh really felt the effects of the g-forces more uh when i started out flying and i think that's for anyone uh starting out whether it's air sickness or or g-forces it's something you have to get used to over time and again it does become second nature you do build up an inherent uh, tolerance over time uh, so you're going to be outside of your comfort zone for a while when you're starting out, especially in a high performance airplane, like the ones you flew in, uh, but it's something you get used to. And it's amazing. The, uh, the human body's ability to adapt to that kind of stuff. And, uh, and now it's just fun. Absolutely, man. Um, okay. So before we wrap this up, uh, last thing I want to ask you then. So from some of the past episode guests I've had on, I've kind of shamelessly ripped a couple of their great quotes away from them um, and asked for a a couple of quotes that they have maybe from their respective teams or uh, where they've come from. So, for example, uh, I picked up Fights On from uh, Wiz, the Top Gun graduate. Uh, Dev Guru's Eddie Penny came out with Own the Room and uh, a Green Beret, Nick uh, Machine Lavery, great guy. Um, he had a quiet professional. Just wondering, is there anything from the F-22 demo team, anything... uh, and any like little quotes or little uh, mottos or anything you guys have that I can uh, shamelessly uh, riff away and, and take away from my, uh, from my pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. Our motto has been, and will be again this season. Uh, and we, we try to say it every day. And at the conclusion of our, uh, our debriefs is just uh, how lucky are we? Uh, so that's, that's our motto. And uh, again, it goes back to the fact that this is a fleeting moment for us to get a, to be a part of uh, this team. Uh, to your tour for pretty much everyone who's on the team and it goes by really fast and uh, it's such an incredible opportunity and privilege uh, for each and every one of us to be a part of this team and that's just a good reminder uh, saying how lucky are we uh, at the end of every day uh, to savor the moment and uh, let that fuel the fire to uh, to work harder and uh, keep getting better each and every day. That's a great round off right there. And I think uh, everyone should uh, take a leaf out of that book. And it's so true. But uh, yeah, well, that's the four questions and a bit done for today. Uh, before we wrap it up, Raz, it's time for the the shameless plug, man. So uh, feel free to take a minute, promote anything that you're working on, your social media, the uh, the demo team's website and stuff. And uh, also, where can uh, where can we go and get our converts from this show to go and see an actual demo as well? So uh, yeah, a bit of a bit of linkage there if you can. Absolutely. I'm all here for the uh, shameless plugs. Uh, you get a lot of information on our team and all of our team members in our schedule. Uh, just looking up F-22 demo team and going to our website and then looking uh, looking up F-22 demo team on uh, your Instagram or Facebook. Uh, RPA does a phenomenal job updating those so you can find our schedule, videos, photos, all the stuff uh, you'd like to see about the team uh, on those social media pages uh and yeah we're hoping to see a lot of folks out of uh, out of the shows we're going to be at in 2024 and hopefully have a few surprises uh in our show uh for the upcoming season wicked stuff man well all i can say is just uh thank you so much for joining me today for the talk for podcast absolute pleasure having you on and uh by the way be wary i got my first flying lesson three days ago so you never know you might find a uh a rogue louis scooper from the uk in a few years time uh up there doing aerobatics but uh fingers across for that man but yeah absolute pleasure having you on the show today dude thank you so much awesome really appreciate you having me it was a uh, great getting to uh, chat with you and again i yeah, appreciate the opportunity how lucky are we man <laughs> thank you guys for listening <laughs> this has been episode 104 if you'd like to listen to the past episodes go and have a look at the channel and if you'd like to listen in for the future ones as well uh hit that subscribe button spread some love by leaving a like and a comment signing off for now and well, fights on see you next time good night <laughs>